In July of 2018, two people set off to hike through the Big Cypress National Preserve in southern Florida. The heat must have been unbearable in the middle of the summer, so it's no surprise that about 10 miles into their hike, they stopped at the Noble campsite to take a break. When they got to this campsite, they noticed that a yellow tent was set up and there was a pair of boots sitting out beside it. And something must have fell off to the hikers because rather than assuming it was just another hiker taking a rest, they felt the need to look inside the tent and see what was going on. And as it would turn out, there were no signs of life inside that tent. And I say that because what they found when they pulled aside the yellow tent cover was the lifeless body of a hiker staring directly at them. It turns out that these two hikers had just made a discovery that would launch a mystery that would perplex the hiking community, the media, as well as the authorities for years. And that's because nobody knew who this man was, nobody. All they knew was his trail name, which was mostly harmless. And even after this man was truly identified some years later, no cause of death was given. And that's very frightening because even to this day, nobody knows how or why he died. This is the story of Mostly Harmless. Before we get into the story here, I just wanna thank everyone who has recently subscribed to the channel. We recently hit 100,000 subscribers. I'm so excited about that, and I'm also excited to say that my next goal is going to be 150,000 subscribers. So please, if you've watched a few of my videos at this point, or if this is your first time and you enjoy this video, hit that subscribe button, help me get to my goal, and let's jump into the story. I really think that this is probably the strangest death in the history of backpacking and through hiking. It's a story that's spans multiple years and a huge portion of the country, but it all starts on the Appalachian Trail in New York State. In April of 2017, a man started hiking southbound on the AT just north of New York City. It wasn't long before he started going by the trail name Mostly Harmless, which he supposedly referred to himself as one night while sitting around a campfire. I'm not exactly sure where this name came from, but it's possible that it was a reference to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, going on a long distance hike like this is a pretty unique thing, at least for people who aren't huge hiking nerds like myself. And in addition to this, there's actually a few things that made Mostly Harmless even more unique, even in comparison to his fellow hikers. This man was not carrying a cell phone or a credit card or any type of identification, no technology whatsoever. Now, back in the day, this would have been completely normal, of course, but once again, I just wanna remind you, this was in 2017. Mostly Harmless had told other hikers that he had previously worked in the tech industry, and he was trying to take a break from his digital life and it seemed like he was doing a pretty good job. Mostly Harmless made his way south along the Appalachian Trail, and it seems as though he made quite a few friends along the way. On occasion, he would appear in photos taken by other hikers. This one right here was taken in October of 2017 at the Woodchuck Hostel in Damascus, Virginia. And this photo stuck out to me because it would be less than a year later that I would stay at that very same hostel in 2018 on my Appalachian Trail through hike. In addition to these photos, Mostly Harmless even appeared in a GoPro video taken by one fellow hiker. He was described as a really nice person and also very strong on the trail. But despite all of these interactions that he was having, he never told anybody what his true real name was. In fact, when he had no other choice but to give a real person name, not just his trail name, like when he was signing in at a hotel, for instance, he would give the name Ben Billamy, which would later turn out to be an alias. By December 1st, 2017, Mostly Harmless walked into Mountain Crossings in Northern Georgia. Mountain Crossings is a store that's only about 30 miles away from the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. He told an employee at the store that he he was looking to find a route from the southern end of the Appalachian Trail all the way down to the Florida Keys, indicating that he was nowhere close to being finished hiking even after coming over a thousand miles on the AT. The employee sold him some maps, snapped a photo of him for the store's Facebook page, and Mostly Harmless, who also went by the trail name Denim sometimes, went on his way, continuing south, apparently 
down to Florida. As part of his route south, Mostly Harmless hopped onto the Pinhoti Trail, which is a 335 mile trail that runs through Northwestern Georgia and Alabama. He was photographed at least once while on the Pinhoti Trail and eventually either completed the trail or hopped off it at some point to continue on south to Florida. On January 24th, 2018, a woman named Kelly Fairbanks, who often helped hikers along the Florida Trail, met Mostly Harmless while he was in the middle of a road walk on Highway 90. Later on, Fairbanks would describe Mostly Harmless as a nice man with kind eyes. However, Fairbanks was a trail angel for the Florida Trail, somebody who helps out through hikers, gives them food, places to stay, rides into and out of town, things like that. And so she had interacted with a lot of through hikers over the years. She knew what a prepared through hiker looked like and based on her interaction with Mostly Harmless, she felt like he was very unprepared for the trail. She found out that he was not carrying a cell phone or a GPS and was instead relying on a paper map for navigation, but the map wasn't very detailed. It lacked a lot of things that he would have needed to hike the trail. And she also noticed that he was making a number of quote, rookie mistakes when it came to some of his gear choices. This caused Fairbanks to specifically remember her encounter with Mostly Harmless and she even snapped this photo of him, which would later play a pretty significant role in his case. About a month later, two Florida trail hikers met Mostly Harmless on a flooded portion of the trail in the Osceola Wildlife Management Area. They remembered the encounter with him specifically because once again, he told them that he wasn't carrying a cell phone or a GPS and not even a detailed map, which prompted the two hikers to exchange trail information with Mostly Harmless, and they went into detail with him far more than they normally would to try and make things easier for him. About two days after this, a woman met Mostly Harmless at the Sand Pond Campground in Pine Log State Forest. During conversation, Mostly Harmless told this woman that he had previously worked in the tech field and strangely enough that he had some health issues and he wanted to do the trail before he wasn't physically able to. This was the only circumstance that I was able to find where he talked about having a potential health issue. On March 17th, a Another hiker briefly interacted with Mostly Harmless, exchanging trail names and basic pleasantries near Paisley, Florida. And finally, on April 15th, 2018, trail angel Mike met Mostly Harmless on the side of the road a few miles north of Nobles Camp. He was most likely the last person to see Mostly Harmless alive. A couple months later, on July 23rd, 2018, two hikers headed into the Big Cypress National Preserve on the Florida Trail. They trudged through swamps, oppressive heat, and also through alligator territory, mind you, for 10 miles until they finally reached the Nobles Camp where they intended to take a break. And as it would turn out, this break would become a very memorable one and not for the right reasons. When they arrived to the campsite, they noticed a yellow tent that was set up with a pair of boots sitting just outside of it. And they also noticed a very bad smell. Something just felt very off to the pair about the whole situation. And so they called out to the person that was in the tent only to get no response. And at this point, they decided to peek inside the tent. And what they saw absolutely shook them right down to their cores. When they looked inside, they found the body of an extremely skinny man staring directly up at them. The two hikers called 911 and the investigation was on. Upon arriving at the scene, I'm sure one of the first things that investigators wanted to do was to identify the person inside the tent. They would have looked for a driver's license or ID, maybe a credit card with a name on it, or even a person's cell phone that could have some identifying information on it. At the very least, maybe there was a missing persons report from the area that they could match the person's description to. But unfortunately for the investigators, none of those things existed in this case. They couldn't even match the man's fingerprints or DNA in any existing databases. It was almost as though this man had zero connections to the outside world. And as perplexing as that was, it was equally as perplexing trying to figure out how the man had died. There was no signs of foul play at the campsite 
and the man weighed only 83 pounds when they found him, despite being five feet, eight inches tall. This would lead you to believe that perhaps the man had starved to death then because he was really skinny. 83 pounds for that height is extremely, extremely thin. Maybe he had gotten lost or physically incapacitated somehow and he just ran out of food. This theory seems reasonable, right? Indeed it does until you learn that along with the man's gear in his campsite, investigators found food. He had food left with him and he also had over $3,000 in cash. And in addition to that, the fact that he was found at an established campsite just makes me feel like it's really unlikely that he would have just starved to death without anybody noticing. It is true that there's not that many people that hike the Florida trail, especially in the summer like this, but I don't know. I just feel like the chances of somebody coming through to that campsite in the time period it would have taken him to starve to death were really, really high. I just feel like somebody would have found him before he died, but that's just me I don't know what happened and ultimately an autopsy was done and the man's death was ruled as undetermined investigators had no idea what had happened to this man and they knew they wouldn't get anywhere until they identified him the Florida Department of Law Enforcement started by creating a composite photo of the man based on the appearance of his body they also released images of his tent his hiking poles and his boots as well as an estimation that he was between 35 and 50 years of age. The composite photo of the man quickly began circulating on the internet, particularly in hiking groups. And it wasn't long before Kelly Fairbanks, the same woman who had stopped on Highway 90 some six months earlier to talk to this man, recognized his composite photo from a Facebook post. She contacted the police and also shared her photo of the man online. Very soon after, dozens of other people started to to chime in saying that they too had met the man, maybe even had hiked with him or camped with him. They were able to come up with the first sign of identification for the man, and that was his trail name, Mostly Harmless. And many people had additional photos of him as well. I was able to find at least 11 unique photos of Mostly Harmless, which were quickly spread all over the internet as the story gained more and more attention. But despite all this attention, nobody was able to identify him beyond just his trail name. There were numerous Numerous images of his face, his gear, there were multiple people that had talked with him about his story on the trail. They even knew where he had started his hike and what his plans were. They knew what his past career was and even where he was from. But nobody knew his real name. Nobody. And despite all this information, the case went cold. For the rest of 2018 and all of 2019, no leads were found. In 2020, the police department decided to partner with Othram, which is a private DNA lab. They hoped that they could discover the deceased hiker's identity through forensic genealogy. Now, despite being a massive fan of the TV show Forensic Files, I really don't know much about this. So if anybody does, please leave a comment and enlighten me. All I know is that through this process, they were able to determine that the man's area of origin was likely Assumption Parish in Louisiana. And after this discovery, they started running targeted Facebook ads in that area with pictures of Mostly Harmless, hoping that somebody would recognize the photos. And sure enough, it worked. Just before the end of 2020, one of Mostly Harmless's former coworkers recognized the man in the photos, and she said that his name was Vance Rodriguez. Finally, years later, a real name existed for Mostly Harmless. The coworker was able to provide additional photos of Rodriguez, which were matched to the ones of him on the trail. Authorities were able to make contact with Rodriguez's family and through DNA testing, by January of 2021, they were able to confirm with 100% certainty that the man discovered in the tent on the Florida Trail was in fact Vance Rodriguez. And at this point, the case was declared solved by the media, but that doesn't seem right to me. Was it really solved? I mean, sure, the man's identity was finally found, that part of the case was solved, and certainly that was a big and confusing part of the story, but I think it's naive to label the entire case as solved because we still have a ton of unanswered questions about Rodriguez and what happened to him. The most notable one being, 
how and why did he die? Let's start by ruling some things out as best we can. The first being foul play. Investigators were very confident that he did not die as a result of foul play. Once again, he was found with over $3,000 cash on him, indicating that robbery certainly wasn't a factor. Next up, a drug overdose most likely was not the cause. The only two substances that they found inside his body were ibuprofen as well as an antihistamine, both of which were very common for hikers to take, and there was also no sign of excessive alcohol use. The most likely cause of death seemed to be starvation because once again, he only weighed 83 pounds when they found his body. However, I'll also remind you that they found food in his campsite food that he could have eaten, food that he carried out there. And in addition to that, he was only about five miles away from a major highway where he could have hitchhiked or gotten a ride into town to get more food if he really needed it. None of this makes any sense. And to this day, we still don't know what happened. The only other possibility that I can think of would be that Rodriguez took his own life, but if this were the case, he would have intentionally starved himself first and then taken his own life in a way that the investigators couldn't uncover. To my knowledge, there is really no evidence that this is what happened. And the only thing that I found that even hints at there being some possibility of this is that it's known that when Rodriguez was about 15 years old, he did attempt to take his own life with a firearm, but he failed. So he did have a history with this, but that's not even close to enough evidence to determine conclusively that he took his own life all these years later. There's really just not any true evidence of that. And another question I have is, how the hell did it take two years for somebody to recognize mostly harmless as Vance Rodriguez. It wasn't like the man was avoiding human contact when he was on the trail and we didn't have any other photos of him besides the composite. That's just not the case. He made a number of friends. He interacted with dozens and dozens of people. And once again, he was photographed at least 11 different times. Before his true identity was discovered, his case was covered by tons of media outlets, major ones too, including the New York Post, Wired Magazine, and Fox News. So it's not like his his story was just flying under the radar. And also, why didn't anybody report him as missing? We actually do kind of have an answer for that question. It's reported that Rodriguez was estranged from his friends and family in Louisiana, so they wouldn't really have been looking for him. And also, a few of his ex-girlfriends had reported that he was abusive and they were afraid of him. It's a whole nother part of the story I'm not gonna get into, but there is some information out there about it if you wanna read more, it's not great. And so they wanted nothing to do with him, so they were also not looking for him. Overall, it just seems like he really didn't have contact at least regular contact with anybody back home or anybody in his personal life off the trail. This whole story is just so strange, so bizarre. I feel like in a lot of the hiking mysteries that I've been covering on the channel lately, there's always takeaways and mistakes made and lessons that can be learned by all of us. I'm always looking out for these when I cover these sad stories and I'm trying to do a better job of highlighting them in the videos. But to be honest with you, I'm really unsure of what the lessons are from this particular story. I mean, certainly if Rodriguez had carried a GPS or had told somebody where he was gonna be and what his plans are, he probably would have been saved. But it seemed like not having any contact with anybody back home and not carrying a GPS, a cell phone, or any technology was an important part of his journey on the trail. He probably knew the risk that he was taking on. I don't know, it's such a bizarre, sad, and scary story. So I want you guys to let me know what the lessons and takeaways are from this one. Leave a comment, let me know, and of course, Thank you all so much for watching. If you watched all the way to the end of this video, and especially if you've been watching all the way to the end of a lot of my videos, I want to humbly ask you to consider joining my Patreon. It's only the price of a beer every single month. You're essentially buying me a beer on a monthly basis, and it is the number one way that you can support this content. So if you appreciate what I'm doing here, check it out. You'll get some bonus content as well. Patreon.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. Link in the description. Thank you so much to all my Patreon supporters who are already on there. I appreciate you all so, so much. And one more time, thank you everybody for watching.